Most mortal cultures believe they are born of the earth. They enter the world naked, and when they die they return to the soil. Their souls ascend to the afterlife, while their bodies decompose, fertilizing the land so that new life may spring up in their wake. It is the circle of life. Mortals construct their kingdoms using materials harvested from the terrain. Some races innovate on this trend by building civilizations beneath the ground. The dwarves cleared vast caverns to make space for their citadels, and in doing so, they acquired all the resources an architect could need, all the hidden spoils of the trickster god's great green world. The elven races are renowned for such quirks. They vary drastically from region to region. The Chimer and Dunma have their mushroom metropolises. The Altma have their refracting realm, made from magic glass that's blindingly beautiful to behold. The races of men, however, they tend to lack this diversity. But there is one race of men who, despite looking similar to the Nedic tribesfolk of Tamriel on the surface, are nothing like their human counterparts. These men did not sprout from the earth like weeds. No, they descended down from the heavens, carried on the biting northern winds. They came to a realm in need of warriors, riding the hawk goddess's wings. When Kine, the warrior widow of Shaw, the goddess of the storm, exhaled upon the tremendous heights of the throat of the world, her beatific breath susurrated through the coniferous forests and warmed the snows which blanketed the north. Her divine draught filled the land with life, and so the Nords were born. Physically, they are unmistakably human, but spiritually, they'll forever perceive themselves as outsiders, sharing no kinship whatsoever with the other men of Tamriel. This fundamental belief is at the core of every Nord. They are one with the wind. Their lungs are microcosms of Kine's elemental power. Every breath is a gift from Kine, and every word sung, spoken or shouted, is a form of sacred sorcery. The creation stories describe Tamriel, the land of dawn's beauty, as the pinnacle of the mortal realm, to which all living things are innately drawn. The elves never left, but the men were scattered, and the Nords were first to find their way back home. This is their story. Hey guys, it's Drew here and welcome back to Fudge Muppet. Today we're traveling to a familiar province to learn about a familiar race. I'm sure you've all heard of the Nords of Skyrim, but that doesn't mean you'll be leaving this video with nothing new. There's a great deal of lore about the Nords that you could never learn simply through playing The Elder Scrolls V, and there's so much environmental lore that could easily be overlooked. The Nords may seem at first glance like Nern's equivalent to the Vikings of our world, and the name Nord certainly reinforces that presumption, but there is so much more to this race that isn't portrayed in Skyrim of 4th Era 201. And with ESO's expansion, the dark heart of Skyrim, a couple of months away, there's no better time to brush up on all there is to know about this tall, fair-haired race. So let's get started by talking about their origins. Every Tamrielic race has a slightly different interpretation of how they ended up on Nern. The creation stories vary wildly in detail, and there's no shortage of imagination from culture to culture, but there are also clear parallels that pervade in every myth, and weave the destinies of the many races together. Unfortunately, there isn't a detailed recording of the Nordic creation story, but it probably contains similar themes, with parallel entities representing Anu and Padamai, the forces of stasis and change. We know they believe they were born from Kine's breath. That's not just a metaphor to the Nords. And we also get a little bit of information from the etched tablets found at checkpoints over the 7,000 steps to High Hrothgar. For the most part, these tablets tell the story of the infamous Dragon War, which we'll cover more soon, but the first two tablets mention the world before humans existed. Before the birth of men, the dragons ruled all Mundus. Their word was the voice, and they spoke only for true needs, for the voice could blot out the sky and flood the land. Men were born and spread over the face of Mundus. The dragons presided over the crawling masses. Men were weak then and had no voice. It seems the Nords believe that before men there were only dragons, and the chief among these dragons was Alduin, the Nordic equivalent to Akatosh of the Divines. Most cultures believe in some form of time god, who came into being and gave structure to the intermingling forces of chaos and order, change and stasis. For the Nords, this was Alduin. The Red Guards, as I covered 
in the previous complete guide, believe that Satakal, the world serpent, eats itself when the world must end, so that the cycle can begin anew from the dawn. Alduin fills a similar role in Nordic doctrine. Another significant piece of information gathered from the etched tablets is a line that reads, Men were born and spread over the face of Mundus. And this aligns perfectly with the creation story posited by the annotated Anuad. In short, the Anuad tells the story of the Elnafe and their separation into old and wandering Elnafe. The old Elnafe were the ancestors to elves, and they were fortunate enough to land on the newly formed world along with their homeland. There had been 12 worlds, but they'd been destroyed, and Anu had been forced to merge the remnants to create one conglomerated world. The wandering Elnafe were not so lucky. They arrived on Nern scattered amid the confused jumble of the shattered worlds, wandering and finding each other over the years. So it seems that the Nords do believe in some form or another, the notion that the men belonged on Tamriel just as much as the elves, but had been dispersed along the way. The Anuad goes on to say that eventually the wandering Elnafe found the hidden land of old Elnafe, and were amazed and joyful to find their kin living amid the splendour of ages past. But this is not a reference to Isgrimor and his companions. No, the old and wandering Elnafe warred, and Nern was reshaped amidst the devastation. The surviving wanderers were scattered once again, and on their new continents they became men. Some men lived in the east, these were the Saisi of Akavir, others dwelt in the west, these were the Red Guards of Yakuda, and finally in the north, the Nords inhabited the frigid expanses of Atmora, and this northern land was anything but hospitable. Vivek, the warrior poet and demigod of the Dunma, once claimed to have travelled there, and he found nothing but frozen bearded kings. I mentioned Isgrimor, perhaps the greatest Nordic hero to ever live. But before we discuss his deeds, let's talk about what we do know about Atmora and what life would have been like for the men residing there. Keep in mind, we know little about Atmora and it's mostly speculation. The Nords called it the Land of Truth. The name Atmora, which is believed to be a bastardization of the elven word Altmora, means Elder Wood in the Elnafex language. It is often described as a desolate frozen land, but as the name Elder Wood suggests, Atmora was once more than a barren wasteland. Passages from Songs of the Return, a retelling of Isgrimor's marvellous feats, alludes to Atmora being a rather verdant continent. Some examples include, on the day of final passage, when the many Ord fleet would last see the distant green summers of Atmora, the brothers were near in their father's wake as the freshly joined 500 would eagerly press onwards towards Tamriel. And then, it was said to be heard on the distant and chilling green shores of Atmora, and the ancestors knew their time had come to cross the seas. And finally, his heart lived and died in this new land. It would forever yearn for the beauties of still green Atmora, before the freezing took it. As you can see, this wasn't a one-off remark, and sailors venturing north in search of Atmora's southern shores might just have been welcomed by a viridescent coastline. In every story I've encountered written by early Nords who saw Atmora with their own eyes, they speak fondly of the Land of Truth and their love for Atmora is perfectly exemplified by Isgrimor's burial site, for he chose instead to be buried on the shore, facing towards Atmora. As we mentioned earlier, the Nords believe they originated on the throat of the world, which to ancient Nords referred to both the mountain and the landscape around it. So when the migrants came to Tamriel from Atmora, it was considered a homecoming. At some point, Though it isn't explicitly documented, the Nords believe they originated in Skyrim and relocated to Atmora long ago. This theory could be supported by the undeniable presence of Nedic humans on Tamriel before Isgrimor's return. But then again, the consensus seems to be that those humans migrated from Atmora as well, establishing their own civilizations before Isgrimor's famous adventures. A lot of what happened in the Merefic Times is open to interpretation, especially because humans were not keeping records of their history at the time. One explanation for why Isgrimor's migration became the famous one, despite not being the first, is because this ancient Atmoran king and leader of the great colonizing fleet was wise enough to develop a runic transcription of Nord speech based on elvish principles, which could then be interpreted by the elven races dominating Tamriel at the time. Isgrimor is therefore considered to be the first human historian. Just one more impressive deed to add to his list. 
The catalyst for the mass at Mora migration was an event known rather ominously as the Freezing. Civil war gripped at Mora, but as the story of the return suggests, there was also an environmental aspect to the turmoil. The Freezing could be considered a metaphorical blight on at Mora, as constant conflict made the realm perilous to live in. But sources suggest that the Freezing was also related to the climate as the green summers and verdant shores gave way to inhospitable treeless tundras. This would also align with Avec's recount of Atmora, he found nothing but frozen bearded kings. There was no mention of lush green landscapes. What caused this civil war and this freezing isn't clear, but there are some fascinating theories that could have some basis in reality, or they could simply be folklore. According to varieties of faith in the Empire, Auriel, the time god of the elves, established an elven civilization on Altmora before ascending to heaven. Then the Nords were born on the throat of the world and came to Altmora to slay the elves. By removing Auriel's influence, Elderwood was doomed. There's even a theory that the doomed fate of Atmora was sealed by the dragons leaving the continent to move to Tamriel. But the latter half of that theory, everything beyond the conflict between the Atmoran elves and the men, is heavily conjectured, as all we truly know is that Atmora could no longer be inhabited. In many ways it shares similarities to Old Meris, but that's a topic for another time. Following the civil war, the Atmoran humans desperately needed a new home, or even a homecoming. This is where Isgrimor and the 500 Companions come into play. The term Merefic Era derives from Nordic and translates to Era of the Elves. For most of the Merefic Era, the name perfectly encapsulates the events. The Elves spread across Tamriel and quickly established themselves as the prominent forces in each province. The Aelids built a mighty empire in the heartland of Sirid. The Kaima claimed the northeastern reaches of Resdane. The Bosma took the dense forests of Valenwood. Though this is disputed by claims that the Bosma were in fact native and did not originate from Somerset. Either way, they were undoubtedly the dominant race in the region, and the Dureni took the northwestern lands of High Rock. It wasn't until the late Merefic era that humans successfully acquired land from the Elves. Though not on their first attempt, Isgrimor led his first wave of Atmoran settlers to Skyrim, landing at Sarek Head, the northernmost point of Tamriel. The Nords then built a glorious citadel not too far inland, and even in the modern day, thousands of years later, the remnants of this prodigious city can be seen and explored. The city was named Sarfal. At this time, Skyrim was no exception to the trend of elven rule across Tamriel. The Falmer Snow Elves presided over the north, as well as pockets of Dwemer who held dominion over the subterranean depths. The Snow Elves executed a brutal attack on the currently amicable Nords in an event that would be long remembered as the Night of Tears. It served as the beginning of era-spanning tensions between Nord and Elf. The exact reason for the sudden attack is obscured by the passage of time, but prior to this, sources suggest that the Snow Elves and earlier proto-Nordic migrations had coexisted relatively harmoniously until then. Some scholars, who were not so sympathetic to the Elven cause, claim the Snow Elves were merely jealous of their homeland, and saw the rise of Sarfol and a large civilization of humans as a threat to their territory. But the more likely cause was that the Falmer had heard rumours of an ancient and powerful artefact, presumed to be the Eye of Magnus. The Snow Elves must have been concerned that the humans would treat it without the necessary reverence, and felt obligated to take the artefact into their own protection. Once again, a skeptic may argue that the Snow Elves coveted the artefact for themselves. Magnus, after all, was primarily an elven god. Whatever the cause may be, the Night of Tears saw spectacular Sarfal become the site of copious bloodshed. The elves successfully drove the Nords off, and Isgrimor returned to Atmora with the two other survivors, his sons Ingol and Ilgar. The Falmer would eventually lament this night, as Isgrimor would return, with his 500 companions in tow, and no respite would present itself to the fleeing Falmer, as they would be systematically pursued and eradicated. Was Isgrimor simply ravenous in his desire for revenge, or did he too seek to keep another race from learning about the ancient artifact dwelling in the depths of Sarfal? The great Lord Isgrimor, the harbinger of us all, as the Nords call him, sent his two sons to scour at Mor in search of the continent's greatest and most gallant warriors. And with these 500 brave souls, Isgrimor and his sons set sail for Skyrim once again. This was the legendary return of the Atmoran king. This time, the Nords would simultaneously settle Skyrim and exterminate any elves in their way. Every man and woman in the expeditionary force was a renowned warrior in Atmora. There was no dead weight. Some of the warriors include the Shield Sisters Froa and Grosta, who fought and spoke as one. 
there was also the wisest of Atmora's Nordic warriors, a war teacher named Adrimk. She brought her most promising students, who would forge their fame on the new frontier. There was Hermeska, who threw his shield, Erluk, who breathed fire, Ramph the Greater, Merkillian Ramph, and the far-sighted Uk, who would see the first of many dawns. The voyage actually began tragically. Kine had given them favourable winds, but her ministrations were not to be taken lightly, and though her blessings gave wind to drive those brave sailors to their destiny, so too did her mighty tears fall, and the ensuing tempest drove the ships of Isgrimor's sons apart. Ingol, the eldest of Isgrimor's sons, died in the storm, along with the entire crew of the Harak. The king would not accept the reality of his son's fate, and one story tells that he commanded the sea ghosts to surrender his kin, and a great gale darkened the sky. The seas thrashed and churned, and a wrathful storm appeared. Isgrimor took up the oars and rowed into the storm alone. Upon the sea, Isgrimor wrestled the sea ghosts, and the storm carried him along the jagged coast. Two fortnights passed without relief until finally the storm broke. Come the next dawn, Ingol's longboat was found in the icy surf, but the vengeful sea ghosts had already taken Ingol and his clansmen. In his terrible grief, Isgrimor slew a dozen dozen beasts and burned them in honour of his fallen kinsmen. Ingol's sacrifice and that of his crew would not be in vain, as this bad omen was followed by countless victories. After killing every elf along the way, Isgrimor and the 500 companions built the great city of Windhelm to the south of Ingol's Barrow, where the king could gaze at his son's resting place from the palace. As they conquered Skyrim, the Nords warred with elves and giants, and every potential threat to their future rule over the land. When Isgrimor retook Sarfal from the Snow Elves, it's said that his war cry could be heard all the way across the Sea of Ghosts to Atmora. The conquest of Skyrim could be summed up by Isgrimor's own orders. Go forth, he roared, into the belly of this new land. Drive the wretched from their palaces of idleness. Oblige them to squalor and toil, that they would see their betrayals as the all sin against our kind. Give no quarter, show no kindness, for they would not give nor show you the same. Each of the captains gathered their crews and set about claiming every corner of Skyrim. One such captain was Jeek of the River, captain of the Yorvaska. Jeek was a legend, not only for his battle prowess, but for discovering the Skyforge and establishing one of the new realm's strongest settlements. The Mead Hall of the Companions Guild serves as an undying reminder of Jeek's deeds. Eventually, the Snow Elves were forced to retreat to the Isle of Solstheim, but the sea would not come between Isgrimor and his vengeance, nor had it when he returned from Atmora. The conflict culminated in the Battle of the Mosring. In the barren pass of the Mosring Mountains, the Nords spilt so much elven blood that it is said the melting snow carried elf blood back to the sea. The Nords were superior on the battlefield, but the Falmer had a remarkable leader of their own, known as the Snow Prince. He killed a great many men with his spear and his ice magic, but was eventually slain by a 12-year-old girl of all people. Joffrey Orr had fought valiantly. She was one of the most formidable of the Nords in battle, but the Snow Prince cut her down all the same. Finna, Joffrey Orr's young daughter, witnessed her mother's death. She took up her mother's sword and threw it at the prince, who sat astride his brilliant steed of pallid white. It struck him true, straight through the chest, and the saviour of the elves died, along with any hope of victory for the Myrrh. The 500 companions won many battles, and carried out many heroics that would be immortalised in many songs. But simply put, they succeeded in their ambitions. They avenged the Night of Tears and they conquered Skyrim. The era of the elves was coming to an end, and it seemed as though the time of the Nord had begun. But alas, there was another race that ruled Skyrim, even after the Nords settled the region, and these were the dragons. The Nords did not fight the dragons, instead they worshipped them. When the Atmorans came to Tamriel, they brought with them their pagan religion. They deified the hawk, wolf, moth, snake, fox, bear, whale, owl and the dragon. Each of the animal totems resembles a god in the Nordic pantheon, many of which bear similarities to familiar deities from other Tamrielic religions. The hawk, as we mentioned earlier, is Kine, and Kine is the Nordic equivalent to Kinnereth. And while the parallels are clear enough from the name, the ancient Nordic variants of well-known gods differ in key respects. The Nords are a warrior people, and this is reflected in their worship. Kine, the goddess of the storm and warrior widow of Shore, not only gave birth to the Nords, but she's the kiss at the end. When a Nord dies, their soul is lifted to Sovngarde by Kine. Kinnereth is also the god of the winds and the elements, and she too carries the dead on her wings to the afterlife. 
But while Kinnereth is a more maternal figure, Kine is a warrior. The wolf is Mara, goddess of love and handmaiden to Kine. The moth is Dabella, the goddess of beauty. These three goddesses are referred to as the half-gods. While our next god, Orki the snake, is the testing god. Orki, or Old Knocker, is believed to be similar to both Malakath and Arke, two entities you wouldn't usually associate with one another. The Nords believe that Orki tricked the humans into shortening their lifespans. He is to blame for humans not living as long as elves. Initially, the trick which bound them to the Count of Winters shortened the Nord lifespan to a measly six years. But sure, the god hero of mankind lifted much of the curse and placed it upon the nearby orcs. Speaking of Shaw, the fox is the first of the two dead gods. He is the Nordic equivalent to Lorcan, though he is perceived in a much more favourable light by the Nords than by the elves. Shaw is a fox because of his cunning, persuading the other gods to create the mortal realm, allowing the Nords to exist. For this, they are eternally grateful. The elven gods may have conspired against Shaw and betrayed him, but he would not be abandoned by the Nords. Shaw is the ultimate warrior, the kind of figure every Atmoran king models himself after. Under his leadership, humans would always triumph over elven oppressors. Veneration of Shaw must have been particularly strong when the Nords removed the elven influence over Atmora, and when they wiped out the Snow Elves. Nowadays, reverence to these old gods seems to be waning. But many Nords fighting against the Falmor and their Imperial puppets undoubtedly whisper prayers to the God King of Humanity. The other so-called dead god is the bear, Sun. Sun is the Nordic analogue to Xenophar, though he is portrayed first and foremost as a warrior, not a merchant. Sun teaches Nords to overcome adversity. He died a valiant death, serving as one of Shaw's trusted shield fanes. The second of Shaw's shield fanes is Stun, the whale. He is the precursor to Stendar, and like his brother, he is a warrior first. He is the god of ransom, and taught the Nords the advantages of taking prisoners of war. Though slightly more brutal in nature, you can see how this could eventually translate into Stendar's merciful forbearance. Keeping foes alive is an act of mercy, a display of might, and an opportunity to obtain gold as opposed to just blood. Junal is the Owl, the god of hermetics and knowledge. Like Julianos, he is the patron of scholarly pursuits, but he is noticeably more pagan. If Julianos is a priest, then Junal is a druid. Fundamentally, they are the same, but religions differ, and therefore so too do their approaches to understanding the universe. Junal is the father of language and mathematics, and without him, we wouldn't have a Nordic history to discuss, as no one would have documented it. The final of the animal gods is the dragon, the chief god of the Nords. His name is Alduin. Alduin, like Auriel of the elves, is linked to Akatosh, yet has developed his own mythos over the ages. When you think of Alduin, you of course think of the World Eater, the self-proclaimed firstborn of Akatosh. But in ancient times, the Atmorans didn't specifically worship the black dragon who ruled over the Nords of Skyrim throughout the late Morefic era. They worshipped Alduin, the dragon god of time. Even the dragon cult who we no serve the dragon rulers of Skyrim, were not initially servants to the World Eater. It seems these traditions predated any one physical dragon ruler. Dragon priests were prevalent in Atmora, and were, in some respects, the Nordic equivalents to priests of Akatosh. But of course, the Alduin we will inevitably talk about next is the one who subjugated the hordes of small, soft creatures we call humans. At the time of Isgrimor's conquest, dragons were abundant in Skyrim. Fashioned in Akatosh's own image, not even the 500 companions would dare challenge their claim to the Northern Realm. Instead of fighting the dragons as they fought the elves, the Nords knelt before Alduin the World Eater and his draconic siblings. And the book detailing the Dragon War explains the relationship between the settling Nords and the dragons. Dragons, being dragons, embraced their role as god kings over men. They were inherently superior, for dragons' power equals truth. They had the power, so therefore it must be true. They granted small amounts of power to the dragon priests in exchange for absolute obedience. In turn, the dragon priests ruled men as equals to kings. Dragons, of course, could not be bothered with actually ruling. In Atmora, the dragon priests demanded tribute and set down laws and codes of living that kept peace between dragons and men. In Tamriel, they were not nearly as benevolent. It's unclear if this was due to an ambitious dragon priest, or a particular dragon dragon, or a series of weak kings. Whatever the cause, the dragon priests began to rule with an iron fist, making virtual slaves of the rest of the population. 
Remnants of this time when the dragons and their subservient priests ruled over the people can be seen in every Nordic ruin, which thanks largely to the preservative nature of the climate, have endured the centuries remarkably well. Eventually, the oppression led to rebellion. The men fought back against the dragons and their priests, but were greatly outmatched. They died in droves, until a blessing from Kain came. Alduin's brother and lieutenant Parthenax defected to the side of men and taught them to use the Fum. The tides of war began to turn, and the Nords won. Many dragons were wiped out, and Alduin the World Eater was sent forward in time by an Elder Scroll. Defeated, but he would return, and when that day came, he would bring his dragon hordes with him. To await their return, the dragon priests had their followers build dragon mounds to entomb the bones of the fallen masters, before laying themselves to rest in barrows of their own. Their mortal bodies were dormant, but kept undying by their followers, who over time became Draga. With the dragons dethroned, the Nords could rule Skyrim uncontested. They would inevitably be bothered by groups like the Witchmen and tribes of Orcs, but they were the preeminent power in the land now, Add more and culture adapted to the change in homeland, and the new powers Kine and Parthenax had bestowed on them greatly impacted the Nordic way of life. From warfare to philosophy, the Nords have always believed they materialize from the breath of the Storm Goddess, and as such, the Storm Voice meshed perfectly with their beliefs. The book titled Children of the Sky aptly summarizes how the Fum affected the Nords. The breath and the voice are the vital essence of a Nord. When they defeat great enemies, they take their tongues as trophies. These are woven into ropes and can hold speech like an enchantment. The power of a Nord can be articulated into a shout, like the key eye of an Akaviri swordsman. The strongest of their warriors are called tongues. When the Nords attack a city, they take no siege engines or cavalry. The tongues form in a wedge in front of the gatehouse and draw in a breath. When the leader lets it out in a key eye, the doors are blown in and the axemen rush into the city. Shouts can be used to sharpen blades or to strike enemies. A common effect is the shout that knocks an enemy back, or the power of command. A strong Nord can instill bravery in men with his battle cry, or stop a charging warrior with a roar. The greatest of the Nords can call to specific people over hundreds of miles, and can move by casting a shout, appearing where it lands. The most powerful Nords cannot speak without causing destruction. They must go gagged and communicate through a sign language and through scribing runes. The further north you go into Skyrim, the more powerful and elemental the people become, and the less they require dwellings and shelters. Wind is fundamental to Skyrim and the Nords. Those that live in the far wastes always carry a wind with them. This excerpt explains the role of the Fum on warfare, but what about philosophy? How can such a dangerous magic be used in the pursuit of wisdom and enlightenment? Well, after their defeat to the Chimera and Dwemer at Red Mountain in the First Era 416, one particular tongue, named Jürgen Windcaller, wondered how their strong voices could fail them, and his discovery is best described by the etched tablets found on the ascent to High Hrothgar, which is fitting as Windcaller had travelled this same path, long before the 7,000 steps were placed. The tongues at Red Mountain went away humbled. Jürgen Windcaller began his seven-year meditation to understand how strong voices could fail. Jürgen Windcaller chose silence and returned. The 17 disputants could not shout him down. Jürgen the Calm built his home on the throat of the world. After seven years of contemplation, Windcaller had realized that the storm voice should only be used in times of true need. Their flippant use of Kain's divine gift had seen the Nords begin to lose her favor. They used their powers to kill their foes and acquire territory, but Kain had given them the voice to save them in times of desperation. This is why Jürgen chose silence. The 17 disputants were other powerful tongues. They were skeptical of his findings, and it's not hard to imagine why. They had gifts that placed them at the heights of Nord society, and Windcaller was suggesting they not use them. When they shouted at him in dissent, the tales tell that Jürgen swallowed their shouts, and with it, their right to overrule him. Jürgen and his followers became known as Greybeards, and they lived in silent meditation, only speaking when a dragonborn emerged. The tenth and final tablet reads, The voice is worship. Follow the inner path. Speak only in true need. 
The bulk of the dragons were buried in their mounds, the tongues were keeping to themselves among the heights of the throat of the world, and for many centuries to come, Nordic society continued to function in its own unique way. Worship became somewhat more cosmopolitan, with the divines rising in popularity, and rather than counts and an emperor like the Imperials, the political structure of Skyrim involved Jarls and a High King. The Jarls have jurisdiction over the Nine Holds, the Northern and Eastern Holds, Winterhold, Eastmarch, the Rift and the Pale, make up what are known as the Old Holds. The Old Holds are more traditional, maintaining reverence to the animal gods, and outsiders are rarely seen. The Reach is another story altogether. This hold only has a slight Nordic majority, and has long been a disputed region. The Reachmen will never submit to Nord rule, and will war until their extinction in the pursuit of sovereignty over the hold. Solstein was technically a region of Skyrim for much of recorded history. It is home to the Skarl, a tribe of isolated Nords, who continue to venerate the animal totems, as well as their mysterious deity named the Allmaker. Since Forfera 16, the region has become a part of Morrowind, not as a result of conquest, but as a gift from the High King of Skyrim. Benevolence aside, it benefited the Nords to make this compassionate donation to the struggling Dunmer, as it helped lower the number of elven refugees crossing the Velofi Mountains. In the Old Holds, there is a coming-of-age ritual for budding young warriors. They are tasked with venturing into the mountains, in the dead of winter, to hunt an ice wraith. This gives a youth their right to citizenship, and serves as a perfect example of the warrior culture that has existed among Nords since they lived across the Sea of Ghosts in Atmora. Another thing that persists from ancient times is their disdain for the Snow Elves. The Falmer are a deformed shadow of their former glory, yet you don't have to go far to find a Nord blaming all his woes on the blind elven creatures lurking in the subterranean caves and ruins. The Nords are a superstitious bunch, and naming conventions seem to derive from omens their clever men interpret in special ceremonies. A clever man was the name for a Nordic mage, a pupil of Junal, but magic has since become a taboo in their region, ever since the great collapse of Winterhold. The Nords believe the breath and the voice are the vital essences of their people, and this has translated to a love for music. Nords adore nothing more than sitting by the fire in a cosy tavern, listening to the bards play their instruments and sing of their historic heroes, while drinking mead, which coincidentally is made from fermented honey and is known to soothe the throat. The other noteworthy art comes in the form of their signature stone carvings, devoted to the gods. These beautiful works of masonry can be found deep in old Nordic ruins, which are equally breathtaking to behold. Nordic architecture is not only built to last, but it is completely distinct from typical building conventions. The grand stone arches, intricately carved and topped with ornate statues, can be seen from leagues away. Some are built on the sides of mountains, and look from a distance like the ribs of some ancient behemoth. Even the average Nordic house is masterfully crafted. They're built partially underground to conserve heat, and use a combination of heavy stones, wooden supports, and thatched roofs to create sturdy buildings capable of enduring anything nature throws at them. The northern chills dictate the clothing worn by the Nords of Skyrim. This means animal skins, as well as a lot of wool and cotton. The final piece of Nord culture to mention is the significance of the Dragonborn archetype. The Dragonborn has been a part of Nordic legend since ancient times. Times. The bards would tell tales of heroes who would kill dragons and steal their power, but the Greybeards are quick to offer a warning to anyone born with the Dragonborn gift. They say that the ease with which a Dragonborn can learn the Fum, bypassing years of training, tends to make them arrogant, and this may have caused the downfall of numerous ancient heroes. Just how many Dragonborns have existed is not known, but their role in Nordic tradition is important. As Songs of Skyrim, the book compiling the popular Nord songs suggests, the Dragonborn in Nord culture is the archetype of what a Nord should be. They have the ability to rally soldiers, inspire loyalty, and bring hope. The presence of a Dragonborn, a mortal blessed with the blood and soul of a dragon by Akatosh, has been at the heart of many of Tamriel's major events. The history of Skyrim and the Nords frequently features one Dragonborn or another, so let's talk about the history of the Nords, starting where we left off, after the Dragon War. We've talked already about the failure of the Fum in the foothills of Red Mountain, and Jürgen Windcaller introducing the Way of the Voice. But prior to that battle, early in the First Era, there are a few names worth mentioning. 
in the year 113, Harald, the 13th of Isgrimor's bloodline, successfully unified Skyrim, and he became the High King in 143. The Jagged Crown, the symbol of office in Skyrim, was supposedly introduced in Harald's reign, and the Moot was introduced after his 78-year reign ended. The Moot was the system used in Skyrim to elect a High King. A representative from each hold would convene to select a new High King from the bloodline of the deceased predecessor. In First Era 241, Harald's son, High King Vrage the Gifted, began the Skyrim Conquests, an ambitious attempt to expand Skyrim's borders east and west. They eventually decided against going south, as the Jural Mountains proved too great a barrier, while Northern Cyrodiil proved too poor a prize. The conquests were a resounding success, and within 50 years, this new empire of the Nords controlled much of modern-day High Rock and all of Morrowind. The empire endured until the year 369, when High King Borgus was assassinated by the wild hunter Valenwood. This was the end of Isgrimor's dynasty. Skyrim was divided once more into individual kingdoms. The ground they had gained was lost, and we know from Jürgen Winkoller's story that the Nords failed in reclaiming Morrowind. In First Era 2703, the Nords were on the front lines of a foreign invading force. The Snake Men of Akavir landed on Skyrim's north coast after navigating the Sea of Ghosts, and they swiftly cut their way through Skyrim. The Nords, as we know, were not the types to meet invasions with pitchers of mead, and they put up a fight, but in the end they were no match for the Akaviri Dragon Guard. There likely would have been significantly more fatalities were it not for the fact that the Saisi seemed to be searching for something. They showed little interest in systematically wiping out the populace of Skyrim, establishing strongholds, and deposing local leaders. Instead, they pushed on to the Pale Pass, where they found what they were looking for, Reman Cyrodiil the Dragonborn. Reman was one of the first of the documented Dragonborns, and his ability to stop the invading force in their tracks, an invading force that tore through the battle-hardened ranks of Northmen, was no small feat. If this was not cause enough to bend the knee before Reman, recall just how important the Dragonborn archetype is to the Nords. For the first time in their history, the Nords pledged themselves to a foreign ruler, when Tiber Septim came to the Imperial Throne, the Nords were once again willing to bend the knee to a worthy Dragonborn ruler. While they did swear fealty, there were times when conflicts arose between Skyrim and Cyrodiil. One such instance involved the Wolf Queen Patima. Patima, the aunt of Empress Kintyra, launched a rebellion in Third Era 120. Patima wished to have her son, Uriel Septim III, crowned as Emperor. The rebellion eventually ended in failure, and both mother and son were killed. In Third Era 397, Skyrim was back to its First Era antics, and in the War of the Bender Mark, the Nords claimed huge chunks of High Rock and Hammerfell. The Fourth Era, which began shortly after one of Tamriel's biggest existential crises, has seen Skyrim face a great deal of adversity. Firstly, the suffering Dunmer of Morrowind saw Red Mountain erupt and were faced with an Argonian invasion. This led to an overwhelming number of refugees seeking asylum in Skyrim. They had little choice but to give solstheim to the Dark Elves, in order to stifle the influx of refugees. And after the Great War between the Imperials and the Aldmeri Dominion, Skyrim was one of the two remaining provinces loyal to the crumbling empire. When the White Gold Concorder outlawed Talos worship, a figure of great importance to the religious northerners, civil war became inevitable. The traditional old holds rallied behind the Stormcloaks and their nationalist leader Ulfric Stormcloak, while the western holds honoured their allegiance with the empire. Around the year 200, 25 years after the Great War, Ulfric challenged High King Torig to a duel. Some say Ulfric used the Fum to bring Torig to his knees, before cutting him down with his sword. Others claim Ulfric's storm voice literally tore the young High King to pieces. Whatever truly happened matters not, as this challenge achieved little. Those who aligned with the Stormcloaks claimed Ulfric was now the rightful High King. Those who opposed the Stormcloaks claimed there was nothing honourable about the challenge. Civil war rages across Skyrim, and the outcome is yet to be confirmed. The fate of Tamriel hangs in the balance, and the Nords of Skyrim are at the heart of the story, as they so often are. It's only fitting that the best places you can go to learn of the rift between the east and west of Skyrim are the taverns. You can find the truth of Nordic sentiments by listening to the bards sing. You may hear it's the age of aggression, down with Ulfric, the killer of kings. On the day of your death, we'll drink and we'll sing. Or you may hear the age of oppression. All hail to Ulfric, you are the high king. In your great honor, we drink and we sing. 
but whatever side a Nord takes, they are Nords first and foremost, and nothing will unite the children of the sky like the old Merry Dominion trying to subjugate them. The songs couldn't be more politically opposed, yet they end exactly the same. We're the children of Skyrim, and we fight all our lives, and when Sovngarde beckons, every one of us dies. But this land is ours, and we'll see it wiped clean, of the scourge that has sullied our hopes and our dreams. And that wraps up the complete guide to the Nords of Skyrim. I hope you enjoyed the video, thanks so much for watching. I've been Drew, this has been Fudge Muppet, and I'll see you in the next one.